Okay, boss. Let's take a look at what we have so far on the Renaissance. This is a story about an age historians call the Renaissance. The name is from the French word meaning rebirth. There was a rebirth of interest in the past achievements of ancient Greece and Rome. The Renaissance began in Italy in the 1300s and spread through Europe over the next three centuries. The world we live in is still shaped by the discoveries and spirit of the Renaissance. Okay, let's hold in a minute. If we're going to produce a series in the Renaissance, we need to show the excitement, get the texture of what it was really like. Absolutely right, boss. And that's why we've got our best producer and camera crew over in Europe right now with orders to get the real story on this Renaissance thing. It's day one, boss. We're in Parma, in the Palazzo della Pilota, to research the history of the Renaissance. The history of the Renaissance was shaped by the discovery of hidden treasures. So the best way to start our story is to examine that treasure for ourselves. Hey, Fred, can you get a clear shot of all these books from the Renaissance? Yeah, sure. You got it. Hey, hey, we must be in the wrong place. You said treasure, but all I'm seeing are a bunch of old books. For the people of the Renaissance, there were rich treasures inside these books, the writings of ancient Greece and Rome. Renaissance Europe got passionately excited about the art, the literature, the philosophy, the history, and the culture of the ancient Greeks and Romans. The Renaissance was a time when society was changing. People turned to the wisdom of ancient civilizations as a model for how to live in the modern world. Love for the history, poetry, and philosophy of the ancient world wasn't just something for scholars working in libraries. People used those books as blueprints for action. Got an army to command? The campaigns of ancient generals were thought to contain the secrets of victory. Got a kingdom to run? Kings and princes used the history of ancient rulers as a roadmap to avoid the pitfalls of leadership. Looking for new breakthroughs in painting, sculpture, or poetry? The art and literature of the ancient world provided models that seemed to offer more than the works of the recent past. This rediscovery of the ancient world began in full force in the 1300s right here in Italy. We've put together something that explains the big picture of why the Renaissance happened when and where it did. Let's roll the tape. In the 1300s, the nation we know today as Italy didn't exist. Italy was a land of small independent cities and states at the heart of the greatest trading area of the day, the Mediterranean Sea. They were at a crossroads for moving goods between Europe and the rest of the world. Thanks to that trade, Italian cities like Naples, Florence, Venice, and Milan grew very rich. To manage their growing businesses more effectively, families began to place a higher value on education. Skills with words and numbers became valuable assets in merchant houses and in royal courts. Rich families often became rulers of their cities. One of the most famous of the ruling families in Renaissance Italy was the Medici family. They ruled the city of Florence, with a few interruptions, for hundreds of years. To display their wealth and power, leading families like the Medicis became patrons of the arts, hiring poets, painters, sculptors, architects, and scholars, sparking a brilliant period of artistic achievement. People throughout Europe began to study and imitate the achievements of Italian artists, writers, and thinkers, and that's how the Renaissance spread from Italy to the rest of Europe. Boss, to make this story come alive, we need to get up close and personal with somebody who really lived this experience that we're describing, and we think we've found just the guy. His name was Francesco Petrarca, also known as Petrarch. He lived in the 1300s when the Renaissance was really getting started. Petrarch is famous today as one of the greatest poets in the Italian language. But during the Renaissance, he was best known for helping launch the rediscovery of the ancient world. 
As a schoolboy, he and his classmates copied out Latin classics in order to study the language. But for Petrarch, those ancient texts seem more beautifully written than anything he'd ever heard. So he used them as models for his own writing. Petrarch was an early humanist. Humanism was the intellectual movement at the heart of the Renaissance. Petrarch devoted his time to studying ethics, poetry, history, rhetoric, and languages. Humanists also launched the rediscovery of antiquity. They dreamed of equaling and going beyond the ancients. Petrarch would probably be amazed by all the wonderful things set in motion by the rediscovery of the ancient world. Look at the Pazzi Chapel in Florence. See those columns, arches, and domes? That's the influence of ancient architecture. Or how about this? For the first time in many centuries, artists were using subjects from ancient history and ancient myths, and that's only half of it. Even when they were showing religious subjects, the Renaissance artists adapted the style of ancient art. An explosion of creativity inspired by humanism and the rediscovery of the ancient world spread across Europe over a span of centuries. And that brings up a very important point. Let's roll the tape. New ideas spread widely and quickly during the Renaissance thanks to this new invention, the printing press. Starting in the 1450s, printers figured out how to use movable metal type to print books and other things much faster and cheaper than ever before. So the ideas of Petrarch and other humanists could spread farther and faster than in the days when books had to be copied by hand. Thanks to the printing press, the rediscovery of the ancient world and the new ideas it helped to inspire swept across Europe at this time. Hey, we're rolling. Hey, boss. It's day two, and we're in Florence. We've gotten a pretty good idea of the intellectual changes happening during the Renaissance, but it was a time of big changes in politics and government, too. Throughout Europe, old fortifications are a reminder that the rulers of the Renaissance used them to defend their cities against war. And that's partly because this was a time when rulers throughout Europe were struggling to create strong, unified kingdoms. Remember, we found out that Italy wasn't a single country in those days, it was a collection of independent cities and states? Well, the same kind of thing was going on in the rest of Europe during the 1300s, but by the 1400s, kings and queens were trying to strengthen their power by unifying their nations. We've put together a portrait of Renaissance monarchs in action that draws features from rulers in three different kingdoms. Let's roll the tape. Renaissance monarchs unified their kingdoms through a combination of war, marriage, shrewd financial management, and sheer ruthlessness. In Spain, the first step toward unity came with the marriage between Isabella of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon. Combining the resources of their two regions, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella carried out a military campaign against the African Muslims called Moors who ruled the southern part of Spain. The king and queen were victorious, and by 1492, the Moors were defeated and all of Spain was united under one government. In France, King Louis XI spent 20 years struggling to make himself more powerful than the French nobles who surrounded him. He was always alert for opportunities to snap up smaller kingdoms when they became vulnerable, adding to the territory of France and he married off his daughters to families who controlled important territories he wanted to acquire. By the time he died in 1483, Louis XI had outmaneuvered, outfought, or bought off almost all of his internal rivals, and France was unified under one king. And in England, Henry VII became king in 1485 by ending, once and for all, a civil war that had been flaring up repeatedly for the last 30 years. He did it by first defeating a rival family in battle and then marrying a daughter of the same family. Henry remained king by ruthlessly eliminating potential enemies, 
and by becoming a relentless tax collector, building up a royal bank account that had been empty for many years. Through a combination of war, marriage, money management, and ruthlessness, the Renaissance monarchs of Spain, France, and England built wealthy and unified kingdoms. Boss, it's day three, and if there's one thing we've learned so far, it's that the Renaissance was a time of profound change. We've seen it in art and culture, we've seen it in politics and government, now we're about to see it in religion. The profound change in religion during the Renaissance is best represented by the event known as Reformation. The Reformation turned one unified church into many different churches. Before the Reformation, the Christian majority in Western and Central Europe shared a common set of beliefs and practices and one central church organization. During this time, the church was trying to raise money to hire armies, build great monuments, and maintain an elaborate court. On top of that, the church was a primary source for providing education, for giving medical care to the poor, as well as taking care of people's spiritual needs. None of those things came cheaply. For centuries, the church had been able to raise money by imposing taxes, but as Renaissance monarchs became more powerful, they wanted more of that tax revenue for themselves to build strong, unified kingdoms. The tension between kings and the church over taxation would help set the stage for the Reformation. And there was another set of key players on that stage. Remember these guys? Humanists, right? Right. The humanists' passion for history and for the ancient world inspired them to study the Bible in its original languages instead of just using the Latin translation approved by the church. So what difference did it make which language they used? It's the same book, right? Not quite. The Latin translation that the church had used for centuries had turned out to be different from the original text in some key areas, and the translations were just the beginning. Their study of history convinced many humanists that the church itself had changed over time and maybe had lost touch with the true values of the early Christians. Looking back at it all, it seems obvious that Renaissance Europe was trembling on the brink of a major religious upheaval, but at the time, the church seemed as powerful as ever. In the early 1500s, Pope Leo X launched construction of St. Peter's Basilica. Hey, I thought you said the kings were making it hard for the church to collect taxes. So how was the church paying for things like St. Peter's? Among other strategies, the church had begun selling what amounted to a faster way to get to heaven. And that raises another important point. Let's roll the tape. According to church teachings at the time of the Renaissance, Christians who died without fully doing penance for their sins could still go to heaven. But first, they were sentenced to spend time in purgatory. Purgatory was believed to be a place between heaven and hell where souls of the dead were made to suffer to complete their repentance for their sins. Something that was supposed to shorten a soul's time in purgatory was called an indulgence. An indulgence was a kind of certificate issued by the Pope, shortening the number of years in purgatory and granting faster entry into heaven. By 1500, some church leaders were selling indulgences to raise money for the church. Anyone willing to pay enough money could get themselves or their deceased relatives out of purgatory and into heaven. So the sales of indulgences were huge, and to finance the construction of St. Peter's Basilica, Pope Leo authorized the sale of even more indulgences. In the year 1517, a friar and professor of theology named Martin Luther protested the sale of indulgences. Now picture this. At the time, Luther was 33 years old. All of his life, he had wrestled with a profound inner doubt about whether he personally could earn his own salvation. He studied the work of Renaissance humanists and their Greek and Hebrew editions of the Bible. Those studies helped Luther find the answer he was looking for. If the Bible taught that people were saved by their own faith, as Luther believed it did, then people didn't need the actions of a priest or even a pope to win salvation. 
So to Luther, that meant people who thought they were buying salvation with indulgences were not saved at all. And Luther thought it was his responsibility to the souls of his fellow Christians to open a debate about it. In 1517, Martin Luther drew up a list of 95 debating points, or theses, on the topic of indulgences. It was the kind of action any respected scholar might be expected to take. Luther raised tough questions, but they were questions troubling many other devout Christians throughout Europe. I claim that the Pope has no jurisdiction over purgatory. If the Pope does have the power to release anyone from purgatory, why in the name of love does he not abolish it by letting everyone out? Martin Luther did not set out to break away from the church. He and many other people hoped to reform it. That's why the movement they started is known as the Reformation. But timing is everything. Luther's challenge came at a time in the Renaissance when, as we've seen, kings had strong political reasons for wanting to weaken the authority of the church. It came at a time when the humanists had spent the last 100 years or more encouraging people to study and understand things for themselves. And it came at a time when the improved printing presses could flood Europe with printed arguments for and against Luther's challenge. And a time when the Renaissance passion for education had helped create a population where more people than ever before could actually read those printed arguments. So things happened much faster than either Luther or the church could predict or control. The church would eventually make some of the reforms Luther demanded, but first it tried to protect its authority by attempting to force Luther to admit he was wrong, to recant. Appearing before a gathering of German princes and other rulers, Luther refused. Within the church, reformers made dramatic changes, but once Luther started to hammer at the bottom line of the church's authority, making a few reforms wasn't enough anymore. Luther's challenge to the church was the spark that spurred a reform movement known as Protestantism because it began in protest against church laws and practices. This movement provided a basis for many new Protestant churches, but just because they shared the label Protestant, don't get the idea that all of these churches were alike. By making the Bible the only source of truth, Luther had opened the door to all kinds of different interpretations of what the Bible really said, so there was no longer a disagreement within a single church or even two churches. From now on, Christianity would be a religion of many churches. We've covered a lot of ground in our research, boss, and we've got the major elements we need. During the Renaissance, a few powerful monarchs began to mold a mix of small, squabbling states into the unified countries we recognize today. Humanists studied ancient writings and they sparked new trends in ethics, poetry, and the arts. Painters and sculptors and writers were inspired by ancient models to set off an explosion of artistic creativity. Men seeking the answers about religion were inspired by the Renaissance passion for history to go back and examine the roots of Christianity, and that helped set the Reformation in motion. Boss, the bottom line is, exploring the past inspires new ways to look at the world, and that's what makes this story a good one.